Okay, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to our third USIP DRC Diaspora Dialogue. My name is Raymond Gilpin, and I, in addition to my work as uh, leading USIP's um, efforts on the confluence uh, between economics conflict and con conflict and peace building, I also have responsibility <coughs> for our priority country focus on the DRC. And we are very um, happy to be able to do this. Um, I see a number of familiar faces around the uh, room. Uh, so some of you might be familiar with um, the United States Institute of Peace. And for those of you who are not, I'll just quickly um, point out that um, we are not the, an, a branch of the United States government. We are mandated and funded by the United States, States Congress in its belief that an institute like ours could help focus attention on helping make peace and resolve conflict around the world. We don't formulate policy. Um, we don't advocate policy. But our work helps influence the development of policy and improve policy implementation in various areas, in various conflict um, arenas around the globe. Um, DRC is one of our countries of focus. Over the last three years, we've had a number of events that have focused on mining, on conflict, on gender, on business, on regional dimensions of conflict. And um, we've also published a number of special reports and peace briefs on these topics. Um, we have done some work in the DRC. Um, in 2008, we had a business survey in the Northeast and the South looking at conflict and business dynamics. Um, earlier this year, we had a meeting on, on uh, corruption in the business sector in Kinshasa. And uh, the DRC Diaspora Dialogue is an important part of what we do. It's important because we believe that the diaspora has a very important part to play in not just development prospects, but also in, the intelle in garnering a vi viable inter intellectual capital to help move the DRC along. And so we provide a forum for the diaspora to do three main things. Firstly, to exchange ideas. Um, secondly, to help build consensus around workable solutions and recommendations. And thirdly, to enable the diaspora to engage productively with policymakers and practitioners who are based in Washington, D.C. A number of um, people in the community have asked repeatedly, why another conference? Why another meeting? because what the DRC requires is action. We're tired of having meetings and talk shops and um, issues relating to um, discussion rather than seeing more action. Um, that is true, but there are four reasons why I believe that the DRC diaspora dialogue is important. The first is that we also firmly believe that action is important, but action has to be informed. Action has to be informed by not just research, but also by the um, views of, a broader, of, of the broader constituency. And we feel that quite often the diaspora voices are lost in this context. Secondly, we believe that dialogue is an ongoing process. It does not stop when action starts. We need to continue discussing so that we evaluate as we go along and we know how, whether, uh, whether, whether, whether or not we are making progress. The third reason is that there are still many misconceptions out there, both in the DRC and in the diaspora and in policy communities around the world about what is relevant for the DRC, what works and what doesn't work, and how best to address the myriad challenges um, facing um, the DRC. And the, first, and the fourth and I think most important reason is that I believe that we still have um, this gap in uh, both policy development and advocacy where the diaspora voices are not as loud as they should be and they're not as integrated, not just here in Washington, D.C., but also in the DRC. And we believe that this provides a forum for the diaspora not just to be able to reach consensus on a number of key issues and help to forge, you know, collective action 
and uh, support behind those um, action-oriented um, points. And so that's why I believe that this is important. Um, what do we hope to be able to do today? Firstly, we want to take stock of what's current and what's appropriate. Secondly, we want to catalog practical solutions and, and, and help map an agenda for action. Thirdly, we want to be able to engage both policymakers and practitioners. And uh, an important part of this effort is to be able to have the, um, you, the um, diaspora dialogue with people working in the DRC. And uh, our lunchtime speaker today is, will be the um, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, um, who has direct responsibility for the DRC, Susan Page. She'll be coming to engage with you. And so you'll have a better idea about you know, where U.S. policy is going, and she would be able to listen uh, to your um, input and hopefully um, channel those um, appropriately. And the fourth re um, output from today is we want to be able to um, take all the um, excellent publication, all the excellent presentations and put them together as a publication, which we would title um, Diaspora Voices in these areas. There are two main panels will be this, uh, that we will be focusing on. This morning, we'll talk a lot about development-related issues, and this afternoon, about political and security issues. And the panels are constituted um, exclusively of um, DRC diaspora professionals. We didn't choose them. We didn't appoint them. Um, by we, I mean USIP. And so, um, but we, we, we believe that we have people who would not be lecturing us but who will be leading discussions and helping um, make the question and answer session a lot more productive. And so I'm really looking forward to this. But before um, I introduce the first panel, let me turn it over to um, Dr. Um, Kitenge, who would um, give us so a, a brief background about where we've, um, how far we've come as a group in this DRC Diaspora series. Dr. Kitenge, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Kitenge Ngambwa, obviously from the Congo. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, USIP for its leadership in actually putting the Congo uh, very significantly on the map in terms of discussions around uh, issues and problems that affect the country, uh, in terms of the challenges the country is, uh, is faced with, and in terms of working towards finding ways to address those problems. And so this, which is a third uh, meeting, uh, had two previous meetings which in fact had prepared for this to be, to be the case, to happen today. We met in October of last year, uh, and during that meeting, we broke up into <coughs> three different groups. Uh, one looked at the mining sector, uh, the second one looked at the private sector, and the third group uh, looked at uh, the zero tolerance uh, policy with regard to corruption and impunity in the country. And that meeting in October was basically a brainstorming meeting where people from the Congo and friends of the Congo uh, sat together and looked at some of the problems affecting each one of those areas. When it came to mining, for example, we, we talked about the fact that uh, so much of the Congo wealth uh, in Eastern Kivu is channeled out of the country with no return or no significant return uh, to the country. Um, you know, there is a lot of blood associated with, with the mines that come out of the Congo. Uh, and some of the things we talked about had to do with how do we control, to the extent possible, uh, the, the, the flight, if you will, of those, of those minerals. And how do we... Uh, demilitarize uh, that, that particular sector in the Congo. Uh, when it comes to the <coughs> zero tolerance uh, sector, for example, we, we, people in that group talked about corruption and the fact that it basically has paralyzed the functioning of the government. It's basically become a culture in, in, in political uh, uh, sphere in the Congo. <coughs> um, and of course, the fact that the legal system in the Congo doesn't work makes it difficult to address uh, issues around corruption. And as far as the private sector is concerned, one of the things that was discussed was the fact that the Congo is one of the most difficult countries in the world in terms of doing business and what can be done to allow 
uh, legal to allow the, the creation of a legal framework which makes it easier for people to go into the country, invest, and, and do business. So that was October. In March of this year, we came back again um, in, in the same venue, and this time we came to listen to some of the key actors in the Congo, uh, both in terms of the U.S. government and also in terms of the international community. As far as the U.S. government is concerned, we um, had representatives from the Treasury Department, the Health Department, and the, the Pentagon was represented by someone from AFRICOM. And, of course, USAID also was, was part of the discussions. Uh, the World Bank was here. The IMF was here as well. Each one of these representatives um, shared with us what it is that his or her agency uh, or department is doing in the Congo. So it was, for us, a listening opportunity, but also it was an opportunity that allowed us to ask questions and to propose some ideas as to how certain things can be done and done in a different way. At the end of that meeting in, in March, uh, we agreed, and again, USAIP was kind enough to extend an invitation to the Congolese diaspora to organize a third meeting, which is today's meeting, one during which uh, we Congolese could propose <coughs> Congolese solutions to Congolese problems. And basically, here we are today, and as Raymond said before, one of the main objectives of this discussion is an, exchange, is an exchange of ideas, basically the beginning of what we hope will be an ongoing uh, exchange of ideas. And as he put it so uh, eloquently, even when actions are taken, the conversation ought to continue. And so that's where we are today, and we're going to, as, as Raymond said, we have a panel uh, of people who are going to talk about uh, some development issues, and I'm going to uh, send the, the, I mean, the floor back to Raymond. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Gitenge. Um, before we, um, st we, I introduce the first panel, um, I'd also I'd like to welcome the um, folk who are joining us by live webcast. We have about uh, 50 people who have signed up um, for live webcast, so if you are there, um, welcome. And if you, if, if you would like to um, participate in the discussion, and um, we have a couple of um, email addresses that are available. I think one is drcdiaspora at usip.org. Please send your questions or comments in, and we have people who would filter, it to <coughs> filter your questions and comments to, to the panel. And I think we are bilingual. We could take your comments in both French and English. And so welcome to the people who are joining us by live um, webcast. Um, we have a very um, capable panel, and they, they will be um, discussing a number of economic development issues this morning. And um, we have copies of their bios outside, and so I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't uh, go over their, um, bi their, their very impressive and extensive bios. But what I would do is just uh, introduce them briefly in the order in which they would be speaking. I think first we would be looking at the, the DRC's health sector, and we, and we are very um, fortunate to have um, Dr. Malonga with us this morning, um, who has a lot of experience in the health sector, um, uh, both as, uh, as a health sector pro professional, an international professional. And so he will be sharing his thoughts about a development program for the DRC's health sector. He'll be followed by um, Dr. Kitenge, who would be talking about education, and then um, Mrs. Um, Agnes Luteta would um, give us her views on the mining sector, and then uh, Dr. George Alula would discuss what um, I think we have we have uh, called um, his view of the Mar a Marshall Plan for the DRC. Um, we have a very, very, very um, packed panel, and what my duty is is to ensure that the um, discussion flows and that we could have as much of a dialogue as possible. So I'm going to be very strict with time, and, and we'll make all of the um, presentations available, and as I told you, we're going to have a publication, but I'm going to ask them to be as succinct as possible, um, 10, 12 minutes maximum per speaker, 
I would actually stop you after 10 to 12 minutes and give the next speaker an opportunity so that we could have um, time for Q&A and a very um, hopefully vibrant exchange. And so the floor is yours, Doctor, and uh, we look forward to your comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, so uh, I will try in 10 minutes to present my thought about uh, the health sector in Congo. Uh, as the Chairman has said, the uh, presentation is available. Uh, so I'm going to need to, to skip over. My presentation is going to have three sections. The first section is going to present next slide, the situation in Congo today. Sorry, first presentation. Where we want to take Congo tomorrow. Second section is where do we stand as of today and how to move from today to tomorrow. So, um, DRC has said that is going to achieve these millennium goals by 2015. So, in about three years. So, these are the goals. We want to have a under five mortality rate less than four. And then you can see also the other goals. Where do we stand? Uh, let me say that really the indicators in DRC are very, very bleak. We used to have the highest maternal mortality rate in the world. Our infant mortality rate is above the African average. So we are in a very, very bad situation. And you can see that even the government has spent less than $10 per capita per year. We are going to go through a series of uh, slides to show how bad the situation is today as far as health is concerned. So we can, go, can see the under mortality per region, This is what we have as human resources, 0 0.2 medical doctors per 10,000 people. Even if the budget is allocated less than 60%, the budget already is very, very small, but even that is only less than 60%. Now, we have a lot of donors. But you can see that most of these donors, they come to support um, what are called vertical programs. And as I'm going to show it later on, that also is really uh, making our situation worse. What is our past? How did we come to that situation? This is a slide that shows that uh, the evolution of the GNP since 1960, when we became independent. As you can see, we are worse off. We were not very, very good in 1960, but we are less than 50% of what we were in 19. Now you can see there is a, we started going, we, we went down between 62 and 65. You know the reason? That was the, the time where uh, 
we have our first rebellion, and then we start moving up till 1975. That's a very, very important milestone in the history of Congo, 1950, 1975. And then we started going down. I'm going to explain why. Now if you move back in 1885 when the country was created by King Leopold II, you'll see that our evolution has, go, has gone through three phases. From 1885 to around 1930, and then from 1930 to 1950, 1975, and then 1976 up to now. The three phases. I'm going to describe them. The first phase was really when Congo had a shock with the colonization. Uh, this is what happened. King Leopold II started uh, established a very, very abusive regime with the red rubber. Please, I'm going to insist on the red rubber because we are going to come back now to the red coltan. Now, red rubber was uh, because Mr. Dunlop and uh, Goodyear discovered organization. And now we are going to the same process because unfortunately we have discovered computer and uh, cellular phone. And because of that we had Congo had the first spread of very very dangerous disease like the, the African human trypanosomiasis means a sleeping uh, sickness. It was introduced, it was not introduced by the Belgian, but it, the spread of the disease was followed the introduction of colonization. And then some other uh, uh, communicators like smallpox and uh, leprosy and tuberculosis. And then phase two started when the nephew of King Leopold decided to change. He then introduced a system where uh, he thought that Belgium could benefit from a prosperous Congo, King Albert. He came to Congo, that's a picture of him, when he was uh, in 19, 1909, when he was still a prince. Remember, his uncle didn't visit, has never visited Congo. King Albert came, and then he started a new regime. And the, re the regime is going to be sustained because we are going to have a string of benevolent leaders, including Mobutu. Now, this, I'm talking about the, the young Mobutu, Mobutu the nationalist, Mobutu before 1975. You can see him here with uh, his uh, private physician, Dr. Close. Some of, some of you might not, him, not, might, might, not, might not know him. This is Glenn Close's father. Okay? And then, then Dr. Close is one of the champions of Congo. And I'm insisting on this uh, notion of champions because we need champions. Then phase three started when Mobutu, the nationalist, became Mobutu, the Mobutist. What happened in, 19, in the 70s? First, the oil shock. Second, the independence of Angola. Third, the end of the Vietnam War, because Congo benefited a lot from the Vietnam War, because we were selling them copper. And then, Unfortunately, the, the, the phase three is yet to be finished because we are still after Mobutu demise. Mobutu's demise, we had Kabila, and then the international struggle for uh, for oil in the in the Ituri, Kolta in uh, Kivu, and then also, unfortunately, we had a spillover of Angola's 
Ugandans and Rwanda in general issues. Next. So these are the three phases of development. We think that we can really, we can still dream. We can quadruple the, the performance of the sector by 2030 by establishing a two-prone system. The red component is going to be the provision of good quality health services that is going to be supported by the blue component, the supporting of provision of, of, of good quality health services. Next. Uh, these are the activities that are, we are going to propose. We are going to propose that we construct uh, health facilities, equip them, provide drugs, and then pay for services. The cost is going to be this. The investment cost and the recurrent cost. It looks like I don't have time. And we hope that we are going to have funds coming from the government, from the users, and from donors. We start with that, and we hope that by 2030 we are going to change the situation where the country is going to be uh, taking care of itself. There are some risks, donor fatigues, and uh, the continue, continuation of uh, what I call the toxic aids due to these problems. Donor fatigues because some people might say what I've uh, put on the, the slide. Next. Uh, people, Congolese, might have these problems from that we see everywhere when, when uh, aid is not well received by the people. They become very ang uh, angry and they sometimes say they, they, they fake uh, compliance. Uh, on the other side, these are the problems that uh, donors that have. Next slide. But we think that if we can ensure what I call the essential triad, meaning if we can have good leaders and we can have champions that are going to advocate, and if we have resources, I think we can can achieve those goals. And we, we contend that the mission, the agenda is not impossible. And second, we say that this is the sine qua non condition for national, regional, and global peace. We have done that before. These are the stories, the success stories of Congo. We have been able to develop the first primary health care in the world. China, Cuba, they've copied our system. We have developed uh, the best public and private partnership in the world because this is the only country where you will see government and uh, FBO, uh, faith-based organization working together. We have been able to control the African sleeping sickness very, very well. We have been able to control AIDS. And uh, with USAID, we have, I think, we have implemented the best, one of the best USAID funded projects in the world. Next. Uh, this is what we have invented. This is what Congo invented and it was after all taken by the Chinese and the Cubans. This is our system of health zones uh, and then secondary uh, hospitals and tertiary hospitals. Please. Next. Uh, we have divided our country into 306 zones, and then you can see that some of the zones are managed by uh, the Catholic Church, some of them are by, by the Protestant Church. Next. Uh, this, this is our, what we did to control the sleeping, uh, sleep, sleeping sickness in, in Africa. Now, in, in, in 1960, the disease was wiped out, almost wiped out. Next. We, uh, Congo, we have made the uh, contribution to the knowledge about HIV. And we have been able to stabilize HIV. You can 
take the picture of Africa, you see that Congo has remained an island where HIV has not been able to explode, like in the in southern other part of Africa. And uh, this is the project that was financed by USAID, and I pretend, I contend that this is one of the best uh, USAID uh, funded projects in the health sector in the world. I think USAID is very, very, very uh, happy with that. And in spite of the war, in spite of all the problems, you can see that we, have, we started, we can see uh, an improvement, a slight improvement of the, of the, of the situation in Congo. I'm almost there. And uh, if we do that, these are the benefits that we're going to derive from, uh, from, the, uh, from the agenda. Next. Uh, and it's very important that we do that because Congo is very, very important. Uh, these are the uh, next. Um, my final uh, slides just say that with, if Congo is prosperous, <coughs> stable, Africa and the world is going to benefit because, as Franz Fanon has said, Africa is, an, uh, is like a revolver and Congo as the, trigger, the triggers of the uh, uh, Congo. Okay. Uh, please, uh, let's, let me finish by saying that, yes, uh, uh, the West has interest in the peace in Congo because the poor man, we, the poor man, you cannot sleep because, because of hunger, but you, the rich, you cannot sleep because the poor man cannot sleep. And uh, you cannot sleep when you have a volcano <laughs> close to your uh, house. Uh, this is the, the, in the Iceland volcano. <coughs> and uh, we are becoming a global village. You can, we cannot afford to have uh, unstable spots. Thank you very much. Dr. Kitenga, please. Thank you. I'm going to talk Can about education. Um, the microphone. Sure. And first of all, indulge me in sharing with you um, a thought by um, Durkheim, uh, who views the object of education is to stimulate and develop in the individual a certain number of physical, intellectual, moral, and I added civic, states which are demanded of him or her by both the political society as a whole and by the particular milieu in which he or she is specifically destined. I am going to also talk a little bit about what John Dewey, who's quite well known in this country, uh, the philosopher and educator, who believes that education is the fundamental approach to, of social progress and reform. I go back to Durkheim, who believes that any country, any society, at a certain stage of its development needs some kind of an education system that is going to move it forward. And I think that the Congo, now that we look at almost 50 years of independence and we look to the future after the 50 years, what's, what kind of a society do we want? And to what extent do we believe that education is going to play a role that, in fact, creates the kind of society we want? And so before I present to you my dream uh, about the educational system in the Congo, let me talk very briefly about what this, the current conditions of the education system is, or are, rather. Um, and I'm just going to use a few statistics uh, from the World Bank. First of all, <coughs> almost 20 years ago, um, countries around the world met in Zhongqian, in, in Thailand, uh, to talk about the education for all. Um, and all the countries at the conference agreed to move towards uh, basically uh, providing opportunities for universal education, at least basic education for all uh, by Iran right now. But as we speak, 
between uh, 95, I'm sorry, 92 and 2006, based on the statistics by the World Bank, the enrollment rate uh, for the primary education in the Congo was at about 70 percent. The enrollment rate of the same numbers to the secondary school went down to 22 percent. Of those 22 percent, only 2 percent went to college. And we, we, we're not talking about their graduation rate, which is even more um, abysmal than the enrollment rate. And if you look at the graduation rate, actually the completion rate uh, for elementary school uh, by 2006, remember 72 percent enroll, but only 40 percent of those who go to school <coughs> graduate as far as elementary school is concerned. If you look at the Congo Brazzaville next door during the same period, of all the students who go to school, 73 percent at the same level of, of elementary school graduate. For the Congo, 40 percent. Now, I'm not an, uh, I'm not an, a, an, economics, uh, an economist of education, but if an economist of education were to study the impact of those losses in terms of the economic uh, uh, production, you have a huge amount of labor force wasted, not, not um, uh, uh, produced. Of course, you have tax revenues which wouldn't come into the country because these people weren't trained, couldn't work. Uh, and of course, the expenditures the government puts into educating these people are wasted because in the end, uh, the human capital is not produced. So at least in terms of numbers, um, that, that would be very significant. If you look at the educational system today, again, three basic uh, adjectives would qualify. Dysfunctional, poor quality, and out, out of sync with what the development priorities of the country um, are. Just think of the five uh, chantiers uh, that the current government has proclaimed as uh, the chantiers for pushing the country forward. I would be hard pressed to find any direct link between those five chantiers and the educational system today that would help to support uh, the accomplishment of those goals. And as we know, again, we talked about corruption earlier, uh, the quality of education in the Congo uh, is perhaps among the worst uh, in Africa. Why? Because uh, grades are sold and bought um, uh, very openly. Uh, uh, basically undermining both the value of that education and the credibility of the degrees uh, that are conferred uh, to students in the country. And so, if we think of the system as being dysfunctional, of poor quality, and out of sync with the priorities of development, what can we do? First of all, one of the issues around poor quality has to do with both teacher education and teacher training, uh, which leads to issues of either underqualification of teachers or non-qualification of teachers. Um, and to give you an idea, I remember myself after high school, I taught English all the way to the 12th grade of secondary school. I, you know, I, I, I just didn't think that that was right, but that's all there was at the time. Uh, and today, you have people with, you know, 10 years of education who are teaching uh, in elementary school uh, and, and are considered to be uh, qualified teachers. So there is a serious issue of teacher education and teacher, and teacher uh, training. But part of the uh, lack of um, quality also has to do with the teacher pay. As we know, uh, I remember when I was working, um, I think at the time it was in 19, 1998, 1988, um, with a bachelor's degree I was being paid $20 a month, and I'm sure that that's probably less uh, today, and in fact, it, it, even the $20 uh, didn't come every month, and it's worse today. So, as we think of all these, uh, all these poor condition, uh, qualities, dysfunctional and out of touch educational system, I, th I divided the, the suggestion box into about three areas. Remember, only 70% of students at the age of school are able to enroll 
and yet the country participated in the uh, 1990 conference, which promised to get everybody in school uh, by 2010-2015. So access is basically one of the problems uh, as far as education is concerned. How do you then push access to the maximum possible? One of the activities that, need, that needs to be done is basically school mapping. And school mapping is a, a census of school age children in the country. We have to know exactly how many, how many children of school age exist in the country and where they are. The second thing has to be the building of, of schools which would absorb uh, these students that we would have identified. Um, and the World Bank is in the country uh, either renovating or in some instances helping to build uh, some new schools. The country is what it is. Uh, in terms of reaching remote places, it's just impossible. There aren't any roads. And so one of the other ways one can reach as many students as possible is the possibility of organizing distance learning structures. Now, I can see you saying, well, how do you do that in a country where there's no electricity? Well, there is something called the in, uh, interactive radio instruction uh, program that's been tried in a number of African countries, in Zambia, in Tanzania, and other places, that use vis very uh, basic technology uh, and doesn't, doesn't require electricity. Uh, you train people to help students through the radio uh, system to basically learn. And I actually ran, I, I ran a program in Tanzania that did just that. So you can do distance learning uh, in a relatively cost-effective way without needing electricity. Gender-sensitive buildings uh, is an important issue as well. Uh, more, more about actually keeping students in schools than, than access uh, so much. Uh, and this simply means building structures that take into account uh, girls', girls uh, uh, conditions when they come to school. And of course, one of the, the documents, I, uh, one of the reports I read, has to uh, points to the fact that school fees have been a serious problem in, in preventing uh, children to, um, attend, to attend school. The second part is, of course, the, the quality of education part. And as far as that is concerned, I split that into a number of areas. One is the curriculum. And as far as the curriculum is concerned, I look at it from two angles. If you look at the country today as a post-conflict country, and of course a country that is aspiring to uh, prosperity and development, I think that civic and peace education um, is an important part of the educational system in the Congo today uh, as, as we look to how to move this country forward. Um, I look at the use of positive histories or stories of, of, the, of the, the Congolese history that would bring more, uh, more addition <coughs> to the country, if you will. Um, and again, peace education, I believe, is an important part uh, as the country uh, looks at ways to move forward and become more, uh, more, uh, more peaceful. As far as development is, development is concerned, I believe that infusing ideas for entrepreneurship in schools in the Congo is a way of creating, of, of, uh, creating uh, future uh, small business owners who can also uh, in return uh, employ uh, people. I strongly believe in the idea of eliminating the tracking system. In the Congo, you are almost bound to choose a field as early as ninth grade. And you know your future is almost determined uh, that early. And I don't know how many of you can say that when you were in ninth grade, you knew what you wanted to become with certainty. But in the Congo, you are almost forced to be to choose one path and stay in that path uh, almost um, with no chance of, of coming out. Um, I think that if the Congo is serious about education, the government needs to to invest more in preschool. Almost all of the preschool systems that exist in the country today are run by private, by private schools. Not that many are run by the government itself. Um, and 
finally, as in, in this section, I believe that the, um, there has to be a promotion of service learning as, as part of how uh, students are taught. And of course, I think that technical and vocational schools should be, uh, should be looked at in a more positive light. And of course, all of this would require the development of new materials by Congolese themselves. Now, teacher training and teacher education, I strongly believe in the need for removing all teachers who have no college education in the educational system. Of course, it's going to take another 10, 15 years, perhaps, to get there. And so, what does that mean? It means that in terms of departments of education, the, the introduction of, say, an elementary school uh, program in those, in those uh, schools of education, which would train, uh, which would prepare teachers when they come out can go all the way down to the elementary school level. I was in Bukavu a few years back and I had the chance to speak with the president of the teacher training college there who thought that the idea was fine except that people with college degrees would not want to go to elementary schools to teach because they wouldn't be paid, uh, you know, commensurate to their, to their training. And I said, well, you know, if, if there is a political will, somebody with a bachelor's degree should be paid as much as someone with the same degree teaching at a college if that person was teaching at a bench school. The government sh just should value the education of the person and not where he's teaching. And of course the pay uh, is to be something that the government looks at uh, seriously. Finally, one of the difficulties in bringing synergy as the country looks at educational problems is, in my view, the fact that we have two ministries of education. I don't see the need for that. I, I would advocate for one single Ministry of Education with two under secretaries of education. Uh, that way they're both together. They look at issues that affect the elementary school and the secondary school, and the person who is overseeing the education <coughs> system for higher education, the two of them can coordinate the kinds of programs that need to be created in universities in order to address the problems that the country faces at the lower level. And finally, um, there are institutions today that are working in some of these areas. EDC, um, Education Development Center, which is being funded by, by USCID, is in the country working on some of these issues. The World Bank is there. Uh, USAID, of course, is there. So I think that there are uh, players uh, with whom we can talk to look at ways to uh, get the government to pay more attention to education. By the way, only 4.9% of the national GDP is being invested into education in the Congo. I don't think that's enough. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Um, as we all know, the um, mining sector lies at the heart of a lot that, that goes on in the DRC, and we are looking forward to uh, Mrs. Luteta's comments on her views of um, how the mining sector could be more um, uh, constructive and what could change, if anything at all. Thank you very much. Uh, please uh, uh, be patient with me because my English is, uh, you know, okay. As known, the Democratic Republic of Congo is a country with huge natural wealth. This country is full-scale configuration of the chemist Mendeleev table, and even more because there are some elements not included on this table. For what's global production, it accounts for around 34th of cobalt, 17 of diamond, 10% of copper, 4% of tin ore, zinc, cotton, bauxite, metal oil, etc. Unfortunately, right now, the exploitation of the vast natural wealth not only is gone to waste for the industrial world, but has brought nothing but suffering and misery to the Congolese people. Very little of the revenue from the natural resource trade were ploughed back into the country or contributed to raising standards of living. It failed to deliver economic benefits and development, 
but it has been the cause of numerous and grave human rights abuse in this country. You can see all this uh, on uh, the reports from a panel of experts, UN, international NGOs, and etc. They recommend all of these reports uh, have the same conclusion. There is a close connection between the violence and the suffering of the civilian population living in the mining zone DRC and the control exercised in these areas by different armed groups. Their recommendation, concrete proposal to end this situation have unfortunately remained dead letters from the Congolese authorities who sometimes find themselves being judge and parties, often being shareholders in this company. This explains why this situation persists and nobody wants to put its house in order because it contributes to build up individual fortune. What to do? My, uh, my solution, what I propose, is uh, the aim of this proposed solution is that the exploitation of this huge material wealth will be beneficial to both investors and the Congolese people, and especially that it contributes to the effective development of DRC. Actually, in all this partnership, the Congolese side has fulfilled its obligation to the sale of mining, and unfortunately, the other parties did not comply or refused to comply with their commitment. First solution, to secure the mining sector. The exploitation right now is characterized by extensive corruption, fraud, pH, mismanagement, and lack of transparency. Much of the mining in the DRC is done in the informal sector by artisanal miners. Violations of economic rights were systematic. It's the must today to secure the mining asset and most important to secure human lives in DRC by introducing an international management through the creation of an independent international organization under the auspice of the World Bank. More, the exploitation of this deposit must be under an international mineral and mining industry agency management, such as the International Council of Mining and Metals, ICMM. This organization will be neutral and shall meet within it men and women, honest and upright, high level of technical and experts in all areas related to the exploitation, processing and sound economic management and financial planning. Their first task will be to develop a plan to develop and plan appropriate mechanism for holding long-term exploitation the most professional way and most efficient possible. They will be from all nationalities, however, with priority given to Congolese experts. Second solution, put order in the mining sector. Despite the commitment to begin with a capital investment for an industrial exploitation, much of the mining in DRC is done by artisanal miners who are extremely vulnerable to exploitation and abuse. They have no legal right or protection, no technical training or other training in mining technique, and no special clothing or equipment. Minerals are found almost everywhere, and so artisanal miners dig wherever they work in harsh and extremely hazardous conditions. Mine shaft frequently kills scores of miners every year, including young children. For that, an, an, an uncompromising audit is required.
on all companies operating throughout the Congolese territory. It will examine whether the terms of the contract were freed in accordance with the framework defined, then to see whether in practice the conditions as stipulated have been satisfied on the ground from a legal standpoint, technical, financial, and taxation. In the case of no compliance with contract terms, proceed with the termination of contract. Third solution, redefining a new partnership, a new type of partnership between the Congolese government and the investors. It's uh, important to redefine a new approach, a new partnership between the Congolese government and the investors and renegotiate a transparent manner the terms of partnership that are not clear and are often in opaque management that encourages fraud from the companies involved. For that, it will require to generalize and formalize administrative procedure. A, in terms of organization and governance of the partnership by setting up organizational chart of the management. B, the conditions of release of capital. C, respect of the contract terms. D, in matters of financial management and accounting. E, as regard to the economic performance and financial F, in the distribution of revenue. It's absolutely a must to review and correct at the same time and in collaboration with the Congolese authority, the mining code. This important tool which regulates the mining sector was designed by the same mine operator concerned and was in fact tailored to secure their privileged position. Turns out in practice, incoherent and consistent with a healthy allocation of concessions exploitation and export control. For the fourth solution, recovery of fees not paid or covered by fraud. Proceed to enforce recovery of all fees and taxes owned by business guilty of abuse. For example, the last year, there was uh, the Senatorial Commission leads by uh, uh, the Senator Mutamba Dibwe. And uh, the, the report uh, uh, put forward that each year, go uh, Congolese government loses about 400 million of dollars in fraud. And it's only in the Katanga, province of Katanga. About uh, this recovery, it concerns this disparity that exists in almost cases between the amount of deposits and the acquisition of potential value in metal content. There, to be clear, I'm going to give you an example. You have two apartments or two houses to sell. One of uh, these apartments of house has uh, equipment, and the other one is uh, empty. Are you going to sell the two at the same prices? It was happening in Congo. They sell this concession without taking uh, account of uh, the continue of minerals uh, in this concession. Tax evasion. All these matches or export, both in the volume of export in value in metal content, which are underestimated. A special effort must be focalized on what is happening in the two provinces of Kivu and the Oriental province, where both exploitation and export of mineral completely fall outside the gover Congolese government control. It's, it's known 
that all fees and charge profit rather to neighboring countries, Rwanda and Uganda, where the minerals are transiting. This money will be accommodated in a special account uh, hosted by the World Bank to avert a humanitarian crisis that has ravaged the DRC and found a development project in this country. The fifth solution, treatment and processing of oil on seed. The complexity of the comp The other particularity to take into account is the high concentration of minerals and their complex composition within the oil, between 3 to 5 percent of metal, while in other countries this level is only about uh, 0, 0 0.8 percent of metal, and the same mineral find themselves into a complex mixture of composite containing General, several types of minerals. The Democratic Republic of Congo is became a far west. The mining sector is under control of dangerous negotiators without any technical skills and financial capabilities who came from everywhere and serve with the complicity of local authorities. It's a mess today to act, not only to stop the massacre in Congo, but also because those mineral deposits that are squandered are considerable loss for whole humanity. They are not renewable. The industrial boom in the world needs them, as well as they are a guarantee for the reconstruction and the sustainable development for Congo. Like a UNESCO, a UN agency protects all concerning the population culture throughout the world, it will be very help, helpful and secure for everyone to put this Congolese huge natural wealth under control of an international mineral and mining industry agencies. Such organization will work and use the expertise of Congolese diaspora to set up a new management. Given all this, it's clear today that the Democratic Republic of Congo needs a new leadership with a new vision for a sustainable development in this country. For this, I think that Congolese diaspora in the United States uh, should be involved working with American government agencies and other private organizations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Lula, please. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I have a challenge because I have to present a kind of business plan for asking for 140 billion state bond in 10 minutes. Uh, uh, and uh, just before to go to my presentation. I'm really uh, glad of uh, everything that I hear from my colleague, engineer Mama Agnes. I'm really proud that we duplicate each other uh, at such level. So she said the country is in, uh, we have uh, full of uh, natural resource. We have also identified that we have 23 trillion of gold reserve known but unexploited in the Congo. The other point is that we're speaking about the minerals in Kivu. Today, uh, 2009, around the world, you have 4.5 billion cell phones around the world. If you can imagine only one cent or one dollar per phone coming back to the Congo, since we cannot uh, raise taxes, it will be very interesting to launch such idea and work on it. The plan that uh, we're trying to present is a four-year plan to rebuild the Congo. It's based on the, uh, the Marshall Plan that the U.S. took action 
to fight or to prevent the communism to, to uh, expand in the Western Europe. But today the threat is another, uh, on up another side, the terrorism threat around the world. And Congo is the country where the nuclear resource material is and need to be secure for the stability of all the world. Congo is a market of 70 billion, 17 million people. We have 20, 11 provinces. The, uh, we aim to go to 26 provinces. I will, uh, uh, Mama Anyash just spoke about the resource that we have, but DRC is a very strategic partner for the rest of the developed world. Why? Why we need the recovery plan? We need to stop the genocide that is ongoing in the Congo. This is for our humanity concerns. Six million people die, two million people internally displaced. We have a broken state. That means the security of the world is in stake because of the terrorism, uh, as I, I just said. And the world financial uh, stability is also in stake. With 23 trillion gold reserve, we can shake any marketplace in the world. Those are the leaders who lead this country through its story. We will skip this very quick just to get some points. Okay, uh, King Leopold II, with uh, what Dr. Miatudila just said, we lost 10 million people, and uh, many survived with and severed. Next. So as I say, we have a global impact on the technology progress, uh, the defense, jewelry, automotive industry, and the global economy stability due to the gold. I, did, I put this in this picture, the Hiroshima bombing from the material coming from the Congo. So there is a book that I wrote out there, the ignored economic genocide that can spend, uh, explain more. This is not the issue here. And I will go very quickly to show the uh, human uh, disaster in the Congo. I put, I draw the line between the Jewish woman and the Congolese woman situation very quick, uh, showing the children, Jewish and uh, Congolese children, how uh, housing has been destroyed, people thrown on the street, same picture for Je the Jewish in 1945. Uh, next slide again. This is just to show the disaster where this recovery program is very important to, to put in place. So the mining sector that Maman has just said, the artisanal way of doing, we can try to find a way to move from artisanal to industrial mining uh, process. So the aim here is how we can stop the international community willingness and stability management because the Congo is going to war every 10 years, but this is controlled by outside forces. So we need to solve to solve the conflict of interest uh, by going through a, a state bond of 140 billion uh, guarantee by the United States as the main partner. This, is, this will bring Congo to the free market world and play its place as a world uh, raw material supplier. Uh, most of the investment or this is the outstanding debt of the Congo are from bilateral uh, cooperation. No private debt is outstanding for the Congo. So we tried here to, in this slide, to show that Congo as a natural resource supplier to the international market, uh, with those rebellion, we cannot play our role for this market. We need to establish a direct link between uh, the Congo and the, our, our uh, customer. I put in this slide the process from the research and development. You go to the natural resource area and all the distribution, supply chain that we're talking about here. So we need just to bring Congo uh, to put those plants to refine the product internally so we will add more value and tape the uh, world market. The world market is running today at 20% of its uh, uh, full capacity because out of 6.7 billion population in the world, only 1.5 have access to modern world. So we, any kind of business is working at 20% of its capacity. So we can move. 
the, this is the structure of the bond. How, uh, next slide, we maybe, yes. The, uh, the bond, who can purchase the bond? We put some numbers. Uh, uh, US, 50%. Uh, UK and China, the same level. Germany, Japan, Belgium, 5 billion for each. So everybody has a part of uh, a partnership with the Congo to invest in different sectors that will be shown in the next slide. So we, Uganda owe Congo 10 billion to repair the war in Kisangani in 2000. Rwanda has not been tried yet, but we can use the 10 billion uh, uh, due to the Congo to set up the, to put the setting in place to respond to education, the skill that we need, as uh, my previous colleague just uh, presented. So what will be the, uh, the benefit for the investor? As I say, uh, U.S., by taking the, putting the Marshall Plan in place, they have a strong ally with Europe, European country. They have job creation. Their industry in the U.S. progress a lot. They benefit from the, the, the uh, uh, Marshall Plan that they launched to uh, rebuild European uh, economy. The di here, in the case of Congo, we will have a direct supply chain from the Congolese. And uh, the international market will be played in the standard developed by the OECD uh, uh, organization. And most of all, it will stop the rape, and mass killing, and population displacement and insecurity. Uh, this is just to show you where the cell phone industry, the most of them are uh, used in the world. China with, China with more than 600 million cell phones. So think about it, one cent per cell phone per month. Per, if they cannot give us per month, they can give us once a year, that's 400 million, just to build the school, the equipment, that, the, the industry that we need to transform our product locally and sell to the world. Next. So this money will be used to invest in the defense, just, uh, justice, security, infrastructure building, healthcare, education, transportation system, uh, state recreation, large and diverse production industry. So uh, bear with me, I uh, just put some number, but according to, by taking the example of the U.S. budget or U.K. or France, or the uh, country of the same size, we can have how we can use this money. Here, in this picture, I'm just showing that for the difference of the Congo to secure the country, we will put $33 billion out of this money to secure the country so we know who is, who is, uh, who is flying, who is getting inside the country, buying U.S. equipment to secure the country uh, that is really uh, needed for the Congo. The industrial infrastructure, Mamania just spoke about it. We need to invest uh, on building our equipment, uh, building our facility to, product, to produce and to diversify the industry. The only industry is not only the mining industry. We need to think about all different industries that need to be uh, uh, developed in the Congo. So how do we go from here and to implement this? Very important thing, the first step is the security. We need to bring peace in the Congo, justice. Then we can move starting on developing infrastructure to develop our agriculture, bring food back to the Congolese people, develop the food distribution uh, network. We need to have the census that just uh, uh, Dr. Kitenge uh, uh, say to know where we need to invest for the education. We need... Uh, the Congo plan to move from 11 provinces to 26 provinces. So we need those numbers to know where the money will be going, prorated by the number of the population. We need to develop the public administration and the health care system. Uh, I've come here in, with this number with, according to what uh, Dr. Miatujila just showed, uh, by putting $8 billion on the uh, uh, the healthcare system to build all those uh, uh, health system area. Next. Uh, next again. So, uh, as I say, this is just a repetition of where the money will be going. Uh, we need to create uh, the transportation company 
building, having our own airline company, uh, creating, having a, a car maker, building car, bus, truck inside the country. We put uh, for this part of uh, the uh, progress around uh, 15 billion just to put all those high, uh, highly needed industry in the country. So on the, uh, we, as I say also, the refinery to refine or to smelt our product, we have the very uh, huge energy capability to provide the energy through all around the Afri uh, African continent. We need to develop the telecommunication industry, the cabling. Com Congo has the, uh, the copper and everything to provide cabling to all African countries and also around the world. We need to develop the railway system so we can connect uh, uh, our country from north to, uh, north to south, east to west. Uh, as I, so I can sh next slide. Uh, Congo is in the earth of African continent. That means the earth, African continent being in the middle of the world, we think that it's time to connect both ocean, Indian Ocean to uh, uh, past, uh, Atlantic uh, Ocean through the DRC. So we develop what we call the David Star uh, uh, transportation network. David Star is the shape of the uh, Israeli flag uh, with two triangles, Kinshasa, Kisangani, Lubumbashi, Kinshasa, Mbandaka, uh, Mbandaka, uh, Bukavu, Kwango in Bandundu, and uh, Mbandaka again, with the advantage uh, uh, that you can connect Angola to Egypt now through this transportation network, and also South Africa to Nigeria and western side of the, the, the African continent. That show exactly that developing the Congo will tape the development of the African continent through such a very huge transportation network. So what, is, what will be the return on such kind of investment? You have uh, a fixed return because of the state bond, 3 to 5 percent. It's a guaranteed return. But also the other sector that you, the investor uh, uh, being uh, uh, state or private sector will be benefiting. I put here in this slide just to show you the country who have been lead, dealing with the U.S., after the Marshall Plan or during that time, U.S. allies, most of them has a gross uh, domestic production around 35,000. That means each individual has $35,000 more than uh, 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 what we have actually if we compare with the Congo at 300 and Congo Brazza are 4,100. Next. So, to conclude, I will say that a strong and stable DRC is for the best interest of all stakeholders. So uh, using this plan, we can provide for our population need in food, education, mental development, infrastructure, development of an economic structure consistent with growth, diversity, and cost advantage benefiting of our population and also the international market. The great region peace and development will come along with such kind of program. The African continent will benefit of it, and the Congo state will be reinstated. And we will have a very peaceful and prosperous Congo for the 21st century. I, I brought here a presentation that can move us from despair to hope. Hope is very important. I hope that going this way, we have a win-win agreement between the DRC and all stakeholders in the Congo, and uh, uh, Mama Agnes and all those, all those who come before me said it. I will really think about to bring a new leadership in the Congo, and uh, I thank you so much for your, uh, yes. your attention. Uh, thank you. Um, very much to all the panelists for what I think have, have been very thoughtful and uh, well-researched um, presentations. I could tell that um, the panelists are not just speaking from their wealth of experience, but also from the heart, because um, issues relating to um, Congo's development and Congo's future are very, very central to all of them and all of us. Um, 
now is the time to discuss. We have about an hour to share um, uh, share um, our opinions and to share thoughts and comments, and maybe to push the panelists a bit more on some of the um, recommendations that they have made or some of the conclusions they have reached. Um, what we would do is take um, questions in groups of three or four and then pose them to the panelists and have them respond. Uh, but first of all, I'd like to take questions from our online participants. Um, they have asked about three or four questions and I'd ask the um, panelists to be as brief as they could be in responding to these. And then after this particular set of questions, we would then open it um, for your questions. Uh, the first question from somebody um, participating online is, if you could tell us for each of your sectors, specifically how could people in the diaspora, okay, make contributions to improve health, education, mining, and the economy? What specifically would you suggest that they could do? Um, the second question, um, I think it would probably be to um, you, um, uh, Ms. L Mrs. Loletta. Um, it's about the International Tin Research Industry Initiative of the Congo um, that is looking at ways to clean up the supply chain and to make buyers of mineral oils from the tin oils from the Congo more responsible and accountable. Um, do you think this international initiative has any chance to A, succeed, and B, benefit the people in the mining sector? And the third is a general question, and it, it probably is more suitable for the afternoon's panel, but I'll pose it here as well. It is, do you think that AFRICOM, the U.S. Africa Command, that its presence in the DRC would help the DRC economically? Not politically or security-wise, economically. That was, that, that, that's a question. And we know that um, AFRICOM's presence at the moment is uh, training uh, it has a training contingent out in the DRC. Do you think that Africa would be um, beneficial economically? So I'll start from the, um, <coughs> with the, with the doctor on the right, and if maybe you could just tell us specifically, if you have a message for the diaspora, how could diaspora people who have both the experience and the training in the health sector, how could they be useful? <coughs> People from the diaspora con can contribute in three ways. Let me start with those who have a lot of uh, financial resources. They could emulate what uh, Mutombo Dikembe did. Maybe not build a very sophisticated hospital, but, uh, but not a health center. Those who have expertise <coughs> They can contribute by uh, uh, sharing their ideas with uh, people who are in DRC. Maybe uh, devoting some time teaching, because they, we have uh, some schools, we have uh, universities. Uh, people are not well paid, maybe these people could uh, devote some of their time to go there and uh, work for both <coughs> pro bono. A third way to, to, to contribute is to adopt a health facility or <coughs> by, by, by providing, let's say, $20 a month to a health facility or by uh, paying for the family members uh, because uh, access to health is also limited by uh, uh, an availability of funds. Some of our uh, family members, they are sick, but they, can go to, they can't go to hospital because, for instance, a C-section or an appendectomy is very, very expensive in DRC. It costs $150. Come on. 
I think we can contribute. We can, we can uh, pay for the insurance of our family members. 150 to save the life of somebody is not that expensive. So there are three ways they can contribute. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Professor Kitenge. Um, in addition, because he said there's three ways. The first is to invest if you are a person of means. Second is to teach to help build capacity. And the third is to um, have regular contribution to adopt a facility. In the health sector, is there anything different? And uh, you might also want to comment on the African question. This is for me. For you. Um, well, I'm good. I'm going to respond in terms of what can be done for education. Education, yes. Right, right. Well, I think some of the things that Dr. Metuda said uh, also apply to education. I, I just thought about Teach Congo, for example, could be one thing that can be done. Uh, go back and teach. Um, I've been trying to do that for some time now. It's, for some reason, it's, you know, it's just um, impossible to get um, you know, the bureaucracy there work. But again, go back and teach uh, for free. There are so many schools and universities in the country which could benefit from uh, the return of those of us who can do that. Um, so you can teach Congo is one thing. The, the idea of um, um, renovating hospitals or dispense, um, um, health clinics also applies to, to schools. Uh, you know, when we were here in March, we saw the, the disparity between what schools were as the World Bank is working there and what, the, what they are now in terms of what's being done. Uh, we, can, we can identify uh, a village and say, one, why can't we target this one particular village, a school there, and do what we can to help that school um, be, be brought up to par with, uh, what, you know, with modernity. And I think the third thing would be, again, um, I'm not sure what the mechanism could be uh, in terms of adopting um, a child or two in a village and pay for school fees for, for those children. As I said before, one of the reasons why uh, access to education is difficult is the fact that there are school fees to be paid, and families which cannot afford to pay them basically have their kids staying at home. So if we can, if we can um, adopt children um, just for the purpose of funding their education, that's one way to also help. Thank you. And you wanted for us to address the African... No, it is for you to oh, okay. say, it. in your in your view, economically, would it um, be a plus or a minus? Well, I mean, we know that um, AFRICOM is training a very small uh, contingent of uh, the, uh, the Congolese army. The, the, one, the one economic benefit, um, albeit small, um, that I could, I could foresee uh, through this is... Um, the, the employing of, of uh, some Congolese uh, as part of uh, the base, uh, this, there, is, there are jobs created that way, mm -hmm. and that's part at least of the local economy uh, in the area in which this, uh, this training is taking place. Thank you. Um, I need a translator. Madam Letta needs a translator. Mm -hmm. Could okay. someone we with try. good French? Because the question was, mm -hmm. um, there's an international initiative to help clean up the supply chain in the tin and industry. And probably um, broaden it to other commodities as well. Do you think international initiatives are helpful in the DRC? I think it's very important. D'impliquer la communauté internationale officiellement maintenant. To involve the international community, uh, community officially. Et qu'ils acceptent de pouvoir négocier avec les experts congolais. Uh, saying that they accept to negotiate with Congolese experts. Qu'ils soient indépendants, qu'ils n'ont rien à voir avec le gouvernement. Those who are independent, uh, who are not implied directly with the government et qui sont capables de des experts dans les domaines. Who are able and expert in the, the area of expertise. Pourquoi je dis cela? Why I'm saying that? Nous savons tous que ce qui arrive euh, là-bas chez nous. We all know that what is uh, going on there in Congo. Nous voyons le Rwanda, nous voyons le Burundi, le l'Uganda, mais ce ne sont pas eux. We, 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 have, we are seeing Rwandans and Ugandans, but we believe that it's not them. 
à l'est du Congo et même au Rwanda, c'était des pauvres cultivateurs. In the eastern of Congo, all of those people were the uh, cultivators? Uh -huh. Former. 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 On appelait euh, le Kivu la Suisse du Congo. Kivu used to be called the Swiss, uh, Switzerland of Congo. Comme du jour au lendemain, ces gens se sont retrouvés avec des armes en main. I was the next hour uh, from a day to the next one, they, they get uh, yes. weapons, guns. Uh -huh. D'où viennent ces armes-là? Where those weapons come from? Qui arme ces gens-là? Who provide them? C'est ça la question. That's the question. Et nous le savons tous, ce sont les multinationales qui sont derrière tout ça. And we know that, uh, we all know that, that those are multinational companies behind them. Alors, pour mettre fin à tout cela, mettons noir sur table. Les minéraux sont là et ils veulent ça. Nous travaillons d'une manière régulière. To handle all of this, we have to put everything on the table and discuss, discuss about what they are, they, they are looking for and what we look we, we, we are also aiming to have in this uh, negotiation. Thank so, you very much. Could I, you? I hope my translation was good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. Uh, okay. Um, I would say that uh, my, to respond to this question is very easy for the diaspora. Each individual in the Congolese diaspora has contributed economically <coughs> to sustain our country. Without the diaspora contribution, this country was dead and disappeared. So the response on that area is very straight and, and easy to, to give. And on the other side, if we go to the expertise, how we can translate our expertise to the people in the Congo. We, most of us, we have some experience giving advice to the people who just go back and just forget what you just discussed together. Mm -hmm. it, they, they have to learn how to use the advice that we're giving them as an expert. Don't look at me only as George. Look, maybe you can look at me uh, with my expertise and say you can use it. A physician like Dr. Miatudila is not only a Congolese, he is a physician. So if you have a health uh, issue, you go to him, you need to pay attention on what he is providing you such an advice. And uh, uh, Dr. Jupin, uh, I will take the African okay. uh, African uh, question. Uh, the African is in, at its first step of cre uh, trying to rebuild the Far East. Sea. This is our hope. I um, always speak about the African seeing the U.S. military base in Europe after the World War II. Uh, U.S. military bases are in Germany, Japan, Korea. France, Belgium, and what does it bring economically to those countries? Stability. One of the slides that I've shown here, you see all those countries are $35,000 or $32,000 per capita per year. That's the business. Once the stability, because people are fear of Congo, because there is war on the region, we cannot invest there. They, we have seen that also there is no private investment in the Congo. But bringing the AFRICOM will stabilize the country and bring peace in the region. Okay, I'm sure we have will have a lot of um, uh, um, varying views on on that um, on that comment. Um, uh, it's now open for your questions, and please introduce yourself and then um, uh, make your questions as um, short as possible. We'll start with the lady right in front. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Euh, je pense la, la, la réunion dernière quand nous sommes venus ici, j'avais posé la question à, à Raymond en lui disant vous êtes une institution pour la paix. Et je pense que euh, qu'est-ce que vous Qui faites vous... I can try. Okay. Okay. comme ça on, on communique. <laughs> Uh, I believe that last time we came here, I asked uh, that question to uh, uh, Dr. Jupin. Uh, uh, oui. you, uh, you are a peace institution. Et le Congo est en guerre. The Congo is in the war. Qu'est-ce que vous vous proposez pour mettre fin à la guerre avant d'aller faire les projets au Congo? What are your suggestions for, uh, to, for the Congo to bring the peace before, uh, pardon, avant d'aller? Uh, before faire starting with the project, uh, yes. Initier des projets économiquement, parce qu'on parle d'affaires ici. Yes. 
euh, euh, Monsieur Raymond m'avait dit qu'il allait me répondre à la fin, il ne m'a pas répondu. You say that he will respond to that, but you didn't respond. Oui. Mm. Euh, la deuxième chose, je ne reviens pas là-dessus. Le Congo, ce n'est pas seulement les minéraux. Ok, le Congo n'est pas seulement les minéraux. Nous sommes riches en faune et en flore. Nous sommes riches en flore et en faune. Nous sommes riches en faune et en flore. Le, nos forêts sont complètement dévastées. Personne n'en parle. Our forests are completely de destroyed. Nobody speak about it. Par les multinationales aussi. By multinational, les mêmes. The same multinational. Je ne sais pas. On n'en parle pas. Quoi, comment on va en parler? Well, well, we don't talk about it. Uh, how we going to talk about it? Sur les, les systèmes éducationnels. On the education system. Le Congo a été un berceau de l'instruction. The Congo used to be the uh, the cradle, the cradle, cradle, oui. as you said. Oui. <laughs> uh, la dernière réunion, uh, uh, the Monsieur qui représentait uh, le département de, de de la santé. Yes, the uh, in the last me, uh, meeting, the representative of the health and human resource. Il avait dit ceci. Said. Nous avons eu ce sont les médecins. Les, 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 les Congolais sont les meilleurs médecins en Afrique. Congolais sont les meilleurs physiciens en Afrique. C'est ça que le docteur Miatudi l'a dit. C'est ce que le docteur Miatudi l'a dit. Grâce aux, à l'expertise des de, 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 de médecins congolais, que euh, Ebola, si vous avez suivi ça, euh, le HIV maintenant a été contenu. Et on a toujours besoin des, 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 des médecins congolais pour. En ce qui concerne la santé, nous sommes là en Afrique du Sud, nous sommes les meilleurs. Ok. Uh, by the expertise of the Congolese physician, we have been able uh, the uh, fever of Ebola, HIV has been uh, controlled uh, due to the expertise provided by Congolese physicians. Maintenant, quand on nous demande qu'est-ce que la diaspora peut faire. And now, when we are, they ask us what the diaspora can do. Mais la diaspora a toujours fait. C'est nous qui faisons marcher le pays. La diaspora a toujours fait son part. Nous sommes ceux qui ont aidé le pays à rester vivant. Ce que le docteur Matudi l'a dit, payer, je ne sais pas, l'assurance, payer ceci, payer cela. Nous faisons ça tous les jours. Tout ce que le docteur Matudi l'a dit sur payer l'assurance pour prendre soin de la famille de retour, nous faisons ça tous les jours. Et nous enterrons, donc tous les morts, nous sommes, nous, c'est nous qui faisons marcher le Congo jusqu'à présent. La diaspora est the one who is just managing the Congo economy. Bon, maintenant, vous, qu'est-ce que vous nous proposez Parce que nous, nous avons dit ce que nous, nous, nous pensons. Et l'exposé de Maman Agnès a été clair. What are you suggesting to us because we uh, have, um, I'm sorry. Oui. Um, c'est ça notre réponse, c'est ce que nous voulons, c'est la paix, mettre fin à toutes ces guerres-là. Ok. Si we, vous we pouvez need, nous aider, yeah. c'est ça. You, you can help us by bringing peace in and uh, ending all those wars. Gilbert Mundela. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm. The past two days, we were in a conference with the, uh, conflict minerals. And um, the whole industry was not well uh, highlighted in terms of uh, its responsibilities in the way things are going up in the Congo. Can the Institute of Peace bring this item to its agenda? Because the root cause of the poverty in Congo, as Dr. Miatudila pointed out, is rubber, red rubber, and today is red coltan. During uh, the Mobutu regime, it was copper and all yes. these things that were also controlled mm -hmm. by uh, the Belgians. Can you bring this issue as a, a peace institute so we can help the whole industry address the problem and stop Rwanda Uganda and this in, in uh, bringing conflict in the Congo because so far no one is addressing that issue uh, seriously in regard to what is going on in the Congo. So to my uh, Congolese fellow, 
Dr. Nyatudila, can you organize Congolese uh, medical doctor like uh, Médecins Sans Frontières who are in the diaspora to go and do something in the Congo and get the tax uh, uh, exemption that they can get from whatever country where they are working. For my f uh, friend Kitenge, there is an effort in regard to education. We can formalize it by putting money into a bank that will lend the parents in Congo money on the nine months uh, period so they can repay, so they can pay the tuition for their children. We are working with, on that on the, with, uh, with uh, so, um, a bank in Kinshasa. In regard to the issue of land, Congo used to have the Bakajika law. And this is a problem I would like Congolese to think about. Mm -hmm. And since the uh, FDL and the new constitution came, Bakajika law was completely removed. And I think it's one of the problems we're having today. All our lands are just given away. What is going to happen is that in Zimbabwe, it, was, it is the same problem. Uh, some people Land. Are what is the Bakajika Land. Bakajika law. Excuse me. They want to, what are you talking about? If you can explain Bakajika law. What it uh, the Bakajika law gives the state ownership of the land. Mm -hmm. It was the first constitution that uh, recognized that, and the, the state was the owner of the land. So it's one of the things that Mobutu held dearly, mm -hmm. and that's why you couldn't have a land concession of more than 100 hectares, for instance, for agriculture, unless you have a special decree given to you to do that. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's why we don't have uh, industrial agriculture developed in the Congo, but it can be worked out. The key here is that in the mining section today, people are displaced from their villages. Mm -hmm. They cannot even access water where the mining company are doing that. Mm -hmm. So it's a major problem. It's not just looking at the conflict minerals in the east. It's not just seeing the exploitation. It's looking at also is the law, is the constitution that was done by outsider helping Congo move forward. All of this is a problem of leadership mm -hmm. that is in the Congo, do we have the right leadership to serve and help Congo move where we want it to move? That's my question. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask, I see three hands up. Any more hands up? This. Okay, we'll take about four or five. Okay, and then we'll come back to, come back to the panel. But I'm going to ask you to make your um, interventions very, very, very brief. All right. We'll start with the gentleman in the back whose hand was up first. If you could introduce yourself. Thanks. Uh, Benjamin Tamboy with Tamboy Engineering. I came uh, from California where I'm based and um, I was invited to the Conflict Mineral Conference and today here. I mean, uh, just going a little back um, regarding Bonjour Mama yes. <laughs> I knew her when um, my first year at the university and she came for the journée scientifique the country did not at the time did not have a thousand engineers yet yeah, that's, I, I never forget her intervention so um, it's really really upsetting to see what's going on with the Constitution with regard to mining. A today date, just as uh, Mamanyas described it, in Katanga province, all the area of the province is already sold. It's not something you can negotiate. Le carreau minier a été vendu completely and not to responsible people or to responsible organization or to responsible governments, to just advertisers, private people from Europe and from the government themselves. So that's why apparently they removed the Bakajika law <coughs> from the constitution. And uh, coming back to the 
main issue about organization. I don't know why um, we're talking peace in the Congo, and we don't have uh, the courage to address the main issue, the main cause of the lack of peace in the Congo. The, peace, the lack of peace in the Congo, it's not a Congolese issue. It's a foreign issue. I don't know why in this country people don't try to address that issue as it is. Could I, we, could I say something about that very quickly? Right. Two quick things. Um, one, we'll be discussing that a lot more this afternoon. Uh, okay. And secondly, our lunchtime speaker is the uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State who has responsibility for the region. So I think that would be a question that would be most appropriate for her. Oh. She would be here o o over Good. lunch. So if you could just ask your question very briefly so others would have an opportunity to, to speak, we'll get back to uh, delving more deeply into the um, regional dimensions of the conflict this afternoon. Okay. Yeah, I mean, then it be just a suggestion for the um, Congolese diaspora to get more organized and have a better connection. I do understand that we come from a long history of division regarding politics and philosophy, but at some point we need to stand up and say, hey, what do we have in common? Thank you. Thank you. Um, the gentleman right in front was the second person, second hand up. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bernard Londoni. I'm, I'm with uh, uh, George Mason University uh, in the master's uh, program in conflict analysis and resolution. Uh, my question, and first of all, I just wanted to uh, thank everyone for the wonderful presentation. But uh, what I understand with uh, uh, all you, you, you have said there, uh, my worry now is to see how we could implement, um, you know, from health to the economy and, and the mining sector. Uh, I have one concern with um, uh, government. If you look at, at most countries in Africa, we, we don't have at this point the capacity to uh, allow the private sector to, uh, you know, to, to take control. But most countries, uh, people have their eyes turned toward the government. And in, in, our, in, in the case of the DRC, um, I don't know if you, you will agree with me, before we can have all these projects or programs we are presenting here, it will take, uh, it will take the, the participation of the government to allow at least these things to happen. And so if we don't have a responsible government which will allow these, these things um, to happen, then everything we, we will be talking here will be just something that we, we will have in paper, but in practical, it will not happen. So I, I would rather prefer to talk about how we could also um, help the, 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 the DRC to move from, a, you know, a, a chaotic situation that we are in today to uh, develop a, a very vibrant society by looking at, at, at developing especially the, the leadership you, you, you were all talking about. That would be the key. If we don't have the leadership capable of allowing things to happen, then whatever programs or project we might have in our hands will not succeed. And, and so I, I would think we could also focus on that rather than just uh, coming with these brilliant ideas and then which in, in the end will be thrown in the sea. Thank you. Um, the lady in the pink at the back. Thank you. <clears throat> my name is Adli Ramaizo. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my question was, I'll be short, I'll try to make it short. Uh, it's joining a little bit the gentleman back there, the young gentleman here and also here. My question is there, maybe I missed it, there was answer in the morning. Is there something you can call a, a diaspora institute? Whatever name you want to give it, give it. And then the key is to organize. Now everybody here is talented and right. And we want things to happen. So everybody can be 
I think you said a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to lose. Mm -hmm. Now, there are many interests out there at stake in the U.S. or in, in Africa, and particularly in Congo. Mm -hmm. But you want things to work for everybody. So I'm saying, is that Congolese diaspora? I'm sure. Or, a dias or friends of Congo also joining the Congolese diaspora to make things happen in many fields, economic and health, anything, you, you mentioned it. Uh, on the paper here, it says discussion to, uh, what did it say here? The workshop aims to discuss Congolese perspectives and recommendations. Okay, we all know the problems. Now we want the recommendations. So I'm saying, can we get organized? Is it possible? Congolese, non-Congolese? Yes, Who I cares if you're black or white? I think you like Congolese, so can we get organized? Is that possible? Yeah. And I think once we get organized, put aside your own interest, because I have interest too. But we need to get a situation where it's a win-win situation, mm -hmm. right? If you want to put the blanket on your side, that's fine. But don't forget, somebody else also wants the same blanket. So the only thing I'm saying is we all have good ideas, I'm sure, here, and we can all get together to do something. The politicians, it's not easy to lead a country. It's, anybody wants to be... It's not easy. But what I'm saying is that is it possible to, for the diaspora to get organized so to have an impact on the local and national government back in Congo, who, which will also deal with leadership here in the U.S. because the Peace Institute here is just giving us a venue to get together and to work out things and also they can help us, help ourselves back there. But if you send in a question, how can the Peace Institute help us? I'm not sure what's their goal here to help us. Yeah, maybe in some different ways, but... American money works for, America's, for American uh, uh, interest. Mm -hmm. So get organized, and let's try to get a win-win situation for the Congolese and also for any friends of the Congo. That's all I have to say. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll have just three more, three more brief. And you had to promise me it's going to be very brief. The gentleman in the back. Uh, thank you so much. My name is uh, George Polo. Uh, briefly, the first question is uh, so anybody can answer. Uh, we had uh, Kassavub leadership, uh, Mobutu leadership, Laurent Desiree Kabila leadership, and uh, now Joseph Kabila leadership. Which one is uh, less accountable? Remember the topic is responsive and accountable leadership. Tell us which one is uh, less accountable. The second question, the second one, uh, let me explain in French. And uh, I need... I want to see everybody to understand, and you can translate. So, uh, nous avons deux réalités en face. La première. We, we have the. Uh, two, I'm sorry. We have two realities. We have to face two uh, situations, two realities, two facts. Les multinationales, uh, ils veulent prendre nos ressources naturelles. Uh, multinationales uh, are, want to take our natural resources. Et de force ou possiblement. Um, uh, by, by force, by force, by any means, yes. At all price, at all means. Mm. Uh, uh, we have two choices. They bring us the war or, or by signing unfair, unfair contract with the government. Et le deuxième fait, c'est que uh, je me rappelle lorsque Laurent Désiré Kabila est entré à Kinshasa. The second, the, second, the second fact is, I, I recall when Laurent Désiré Kabila came in power. Nous avons vu les directeurs, les chefs de division de l'OFIDA et même donc des de, de, de contributions, ce qu'on appelle... Euh, oui, IRS. IRS. We have seen a director of uh, our internal revenue services. Contribution, même la DGHAD. And uh, the control uh, institution also. Ils étaient tout peur parce qu'ils se disaient il y a il y a un nouveau leadership. They they have a fear of a new leadership. Parce qu'ils sont très forts dans la fraude donc dans. Because they were very they were very strong on uh, the uh, state money stealing. Could you ask the question, oh, please? Uh, uh, ma question est celle-ci. Donc pendant les trois mois, uh, ils ont vu les nouveaux pouvoirs. Mm -hmm. Ils ont dit laissons observer mm -hmm. si effectivement ils connaissent le terrain comment boucher les trous. Uh, uh, during the first quarter, they just observe if the new leader knows what's going on on the ground and uh, if they will detect how to 
prevent any fraud. Et ils vont se rendre compte que le nouveau leadership accompagné des gens de la diaspora ne connaissait pas le terrain et and ils ont they, pris le vol, le pillage. And they, they found out that those uh, newcomers didn't know how it was working and they, they still more. Alors ma question est celle-ci. And my question. Et je la pose voilà justement au docteur Alula. Uh, I asked this question to Dr. Alula. Uh, vous avez expliqué donc un bon plan ici. Mm -hmm. You explain a good plan here. Comment pouvez-vous le rendre beaucoup plus effectif en tenant compte de ces deux réalités? How would you rend, uh, make it effective uh, by taking in, in account uh, those two realities? Merci. Thank you. Thanks. I think we're almost out of time. I have a last question from Emira. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Emira Woods with the Institute for Policy Studies. I want to first begin by thanking USIP for convening this session um, and uh, the, the panelists, because it really was fascinating hearing your presentations. Thank you all. I guess I, you know, we're, we're here uh, 50 years after the independence, officially, of Congo. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I think it goes back to this question. It keeps coming up of leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and I, overall, I, I, I fear that many of your um, presentations um, didn't go at the core, which is really the need for Congo to assert its own sovereignty uh, from the neighbors, from the multinationals, from the international institutions. Um, so I, I guess overall, I, I, I'm, I'm wanting to hear a bit more your, uh, your commentary on this question of sovereignty and rights of Congo. I think it comes in two contexts. First, on the economic side, and I know you asked us to be brief, Raymond, I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> on the economic side, you know, um, uh, the World Bank in particular has played such a pivotal role in taking away its sovereignty. Uh, for example, the discussion of user fees in, in the healthcare system that was really uh, uh, a condition placed by the World Bank and IMF, not only in the Congo, but in many other countries. And, um, at, and yet, the, the solution <laughs> in the discussion on health was to set up a World Bank program. I didn't understand um, that, really, because it does seem to, to take away, again, this notion of Congo needing to assert its own sovereignty. On the um, question of AFRICOM, I feel like that's the most blatant <laughs> in terms of the uh, taking away of sovereignty rights. Mm. Uh, AFRICOM was described as doing training. That sounds nice, mm. <laughs> but in reality we know it's not just training. It's also equipping, giving guns and weapons. Okay. Uh, it's one battalion that the U.S. is doing, uh, training and arming. Uh, we also understand that China is training and arming another battalion, that the European Union is training and arming another battalion, and in the end, it will be the Congolese people who pay the highest price. So I, 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 this discussion was meant to talk about uh, leadership. Uh, I think it goes to the core of what's needed in the Congo and it keeps coming up time and time again. Um, but on these issues of both economic rights and, and uh, rights over control of one's military, rights uh, to, to choose freely the leadership of the Congo and then to hold those leaders accountable. I feel like those questions uh, have not been addressed as fully as they need to be in the presentation so far. Uh, so I, 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 I really, I think we need a full session on AFRICOM because I think there could be a, a debate that goes uh, quite steadily to the heart of, of these questions. But uh, in the interest of time, maybe we'll just leave it to, to ask you uh, in terms of this question of sovereignty, if you can expand a bit more on your comments at this point. Okay, thank you so much for all of your questions. Um, <clears throat> and it's, and there's a, there, we, I have a couple of questions from our online participants, um, which sort of um, reinforce what Emira just said. And there's a couple from the Congolese American Council for Peace and Development. And um, one of the points they made was um, taking you to task, um, Mrs. Um, Loteta. Um, and the question was, rather than putting Congolese minerals under international control, why not make sure that the laws and the policies within the Congo are working well for the people of the Congo? Would that not be a better um, a better approach to make sure that the laws of the land regarding the mining sector are working to reinforce um, human development. Um, a question, I think this is for you. Um, 
um, Professor Kitenge was about the um, education sector, and uh, they wanted to know whether a moratorium on fees would be a good way to encourage uh, uh, boosting of enrollment. And uh, the, qu the question is, seems to suggest that this would be an incentive to stop young men from joining militias and being parts of rape gangs. Um, there's also been the, a lot of interest uh, in your Marshall Plan, Dr. Mm -hmm. Lula. Mm -hmm. uh, but the one question is, um, how would you measure the, the effectiveness of, of, of such a plan? Mm -hmm. It seems pretty um, broad mm -hmm. and in some senses um, a little uh, unwielding. But how would you make sure that this is something that could deliver not just for the investors in the bonds, mm -hmm. but for the um, Congolese people? Mm -hmm. And also, have you talked to people, um, with the potential funders you mentioned already, and what sort of response are you getting? Mm -hmm. I think that um, drawing us back to the issue of responsive and accountable leadership is important. Um, because at the end of the day, what we want, what, what, what I think we are all pulling for is a Congo that has a leadership that is responsive, not just to the needs of um, state building, but to the needs of the people, and accountable for actions. And um, in your concluding comments, and we'll start with you first this time and work, work our way down, mm -hmm. could you um, take three to four minutes just saying specifically how your ideas would help buttress responsive and accountable leadership that's sustainable within the Congo um, context, in the economy, in the mining sector, in education, and in health. Starting with you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Sorry? Okay. Yeah, ask a question. Mm. Uh, apparently, people are not satisfied because none of them will respond to the question that they No, they are going to ask. But remaining 20 minutes, and if you have to talk as I Well, I. And this motion is taking another two minutes. That's the, the, the problem is we had the problem is we had we had questions that went on for uh, for too long, and not giving them time mm. to uh, respond. Mm. So in the, in in your res, in, in their response in their responses, they're going to keep they're going to try to address as many as possible. So if we'll give the panelists um, the benefit of the doubt that they will do justice, we can't judge that they haven't responded before they have spoken. Yeah. So let's give them an opportunity to speak first, and then after we'll say they haven't responded. They've all been listening. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I have respect for Kasavubu Mobutu for the first part of his uh, power. Laurent Desir, Kabila came with, came with some idea. He didn't have time to complete it. Um, second question is, how do I, we can take care of uh, the effectiveness of uh, knowing what is going on the ground? If you go there and try to implement, to work with the same system, you will fail. But when you come out, knowing how it works outside, that means your expertise. You can go and say, okay, I put this audit here and know how the information system is working, I will catch them very quickly. So I will use my expertise to solve this problem that Laurent Desiree Kabila have, uh, knowing how to manage the financial system of the government. Uh, I hope I answered your question, but if you need more, we'll talk about it. And, um, the Marshall Plan that I say, uh, it's, it's to, show, to present a business plan, it takes an hour. I have to, take it, to make it in 10 minutes. There is different topic on the business plan that I cannot go, I could not go f through in 10 minutes. But uh, uh, I spoke with some people who are, if I keep on talking about it, because some very decision maker are interested to know uh, to this kind of plan. They say this is what we, we, we wanted to hear from the Congolese, because Congo is the size of Western Europe. Bear in mind, Spain, Portugal, France, Belgium, Germany, uh, some part of England. That's Congo. If you give us $18 million, what can we do with that? If you give us $1 billion, what can we do with that? To take in account the fact that Chinese come with $7 billion, 
and asking for 19, uh, 90 billion out of that. Uh, that's why we say no. Everybody will put the, the piece on the table. Everybody come and it costs 140 billion to rebuild this country. And so when European, American and so have to travel in the Congo, they don't have to take vaccination or try to locate where they will be living because we <coughs> build the country on the uh, modern uh, standard way. Uh, I'm done with that. If I, I skip one question, uh, just remind me. Uh, yes, the military. Mm. No, sovereignty. Uh, the sovereignty uh, uh, here, we un I understand, Amy, but uh, um, uh, to respond this, to this question, I just came from the region where my family has been killed. I have experienced this. So when I see the experience of uh, U.S. military base in Europe, uh, AFRICOM is not yet saying that they really build a, a military base in the Congo, but uh, if uh, you have a, a vision, you can see that we will go to this point, is to secure the country. So once we have a new leadership, a new government to establish a true agreement of defense, as Mobutu used to have, we will defend our country to, so Rwanda and Uganda will go play around in other uh, places, not in the Congo. I believe in the AFRICOM project and uh, we can work on why some people may not agree for that. As you say, we can take a day, but I will finally convince you that Africa is really needed. <laughs> Ma'am. Okay. Comment le secteur le secteur euh, minier mm. peut aider au développement du Congo, c'est ça euh, Avec le support international. Avec le support international. Mm. Ok. Je crois que euh, mon jeune frère, c'est pas mon fils là-bas. My, my young brother, uh, not my son. Uh, it, it's my son. Mm. As you le Raise, raise a point. À soulever deux points importants. Raise two important points. La l'intervention, l'intervention de multinational. The multinational involvement. Et même des pays occidentaux. And uh, Western uh, countries. À cause de ces richesses, Mama Christine a ajouté les autres uh, ressources naturelles. Because of this richness and other natural resources. Le Congo ne sera jamais en paix. Congo will never be in peace. Vous-même, vous avez parlé, on a parlé des red... Uh, you, you spoke about the red uh, rubber, caoutchouc. Okay. Mm -hmm. Et ce premier génocide des Congolais, il a fallu un Américain... Uh, the, for, for this first genocide of the Congolese... C'est un Américain it, qui s'est rendu compte au Congo, qui s'est uh, rendu au Congo et qui a découvert ses monstruosités. Uh, it's a American leadership, one of the American who traveled in this country and found it and uh, stand up uh, to fight it. Yeah. Et c'est à cause de cela que tout cela avait été arrêté avec l'intervention des Américains. That's the way everything was stopped with the American uh, uh, leadership. Aujourd'hui, nous nous retrouvons au même point. Today we are in the same point. Le Congo n'est pas du tout indépendant. Le Congo est pris en otage. The, the Congo is not uh, uh, free, is uh, like in, taken in hostage. C'est ça? Yeah. Mm. Et uh, tout, tout ce qui se fait au Congo est décidé. On a parlé de la Constitution. La Constitution a été écrite en Europe. Everything that is about the Congo is done outside the country. The Constitution Le... was written in Europe. Le code minier, avec toutes les conséquences qu'on connaît aujourd'hui, écrit en Europe. Mining code written in Europe. L'Europe, le, le, surtout la Belgique, décide de qui on veut mettre à la tête de ce pays-là. European country, and especially Belgium, decide who they will put to lead in this country. C'est ça le grand problème avec le Congo. That's, that's the big problem with Congo today. Comment le, 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 je suis arrivé des fois à proposer des solutions extrêmes. Uh, Sometimes I come with some solutions very extreme. En disant actuellement au Congo, saying actually in Congo, on n'a pas besoin de leaders politiques. We don't need political leader. 
Parce qu'ils sont facilement influençables. Because they are easily influenceable. Pourquoi ne mm. pas mettre à la tête de ces pays un collègue de d'experts? Why don't we put a, 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 a committee of experts to lead the country? Pour the council. dans un premier temps. For the, in the first step, remettre les infrastructures de gestion qui n'existent plus. To put back all the uh, management infrastructure that uh, no longer exist. Aujourd'hui, on peut mettre quelqu'un d'intelligent. Il l'a souligné avec tous tous ces moyens qu'on a trouvé de corruption, de, de détournement. Il n'arrivera pas à faire quelque chose. Today we can put some very uh, wise or uh, smart guy uh, to lead this country, but with all the means of corruption and everything on the ground, he will never be successful. I spent 20 years at the Jekamin. And the state budget depended on 80% of the products Jekamin. Uh, depend, rely on 80% of uh, the revenue from Jekamin. And uh, the Jekamin from its product, product and services around was uh, um, really uh, helping so many uh, small business uh, all around the, the country. On a décidé de, de casser le, la Jekamine. They decided to break the Jekamine. On a cassé l'économie du Congo. It broke down the con Congo economy. On a cassé la vie de plusieurs familles. Uh, the life of many families has been broken. En prenant toutes ces décisions-là, quels sont les experts congolais qui ont été associés à cela? By taking those kind of decisions, who are uh, those expert, Congolese experts who have been involved in such kind of uh, decision. Je pense que nous sommes au point de départ où aujourd'hui les Congolais seuls ne peuvent pas s'en sortir. We, we are in a point where the Congolese cannot uh, really succeed, succeed by themselves. Nous allons auprès de ceux-là qui sont à la base de toute cette situation et négocier avec eux. We, go, we have to go to those people who are responsible of this situation and negotiate with them. Moi je crois que c'est la, la, la seule solution. And that's the only solution in which I believe. Thank you very much. Mm. And Professor Kitenge, you had a couple of questions and then your views on the sovereignty issue. Uh, let me take my <coughs> questions related to education first. I, I, I think that instead of just a, a moratorium, the school fees should be completely abolished, at least for K through 12. <coughs> and here's why. If, a government, if the government can pay uh, what is called non in French as bus, to college students, then there is a way, first of all, that's a very elitist system. You make kids from K to 12 to pay to go to school, and only families that can afford to send kids to school, then once their children get into uh, colleges, the government pays them to go to school. That's silly. So why don't, why don't you abolish school fees for K through 12 by the money the government is using now to pay students who go, who go to college, and just they do it? No longer what? The bus schools? Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's been, it's being it's reinstated. Yes, it's yes. being reinstated. It was. So if we can do away with that, that, that's one thing. The other thing is the country is, is being helped to negotiate its, uh, its foreign debt. The money that's going to be uh, forgiven. Clear. Right. The country, sh the government should uh, use that money to help uh, kids not to pay school fees at all. So a moratorium for me is, is just <coughs> away with it. So, so I think that's, that's, that's um, question, the only question I think I had for education. And then in terms of some, the other questions, um, when we talked about leadership, we forgot Lumumba. Uh, in, in my judgment, Lumumba, I think, was perhaps what, one of the strongest leaders the country has had. Sure, Kasabubu was president, but Lumumba played, um, you know, a significant role in helping the country uh, be moved, moved forward, although in a, in a very short time. Um, Mobutu started well. Um, 
I'm not sure I'm not sure his intentions were good but he studied well and then we know what happened um, Kabila the father is or was in large measures responsible for much of the trouble we're having today because of his thirst for power he brought in people who shouldn't have been to come to the country in the first place and now we're having problems you know getting rid of them and his his you know the other Kabila, um, no comment. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so, so the, that's as far as that's as far as leadership is concerned. Um, the issue of sovereignty, the issue of sovereignty, is a very important issue as far as the country. And I and and you know I have to say that when when we when we we basically give up. Um, you know, the right to run our own country. I, I am uncomfortable with the idea of saying that, you know, we as a people um, cannot do anything to, to change uh, what's going on in the country. Um, sure, we have, all, we have the things we have, but we are not the only country in the world uh, which possesses all the minerals and wealth. Um, Angola is running its own country. Angola has its own leaders. Why are Angolans defending the sovereignty of, the, of their own country with all the, the diamonds and oil they have, uh, you may you may uh, cringe at my example of, of Zimbabwe. I'm not I'm not using Zimbabwe because the, the country is being run well. I'm using Zimbabwe simply in terms of uh, the, the issue of sovereignty. Zimbabwe has diamonds, uh, but but Zimbabwe is running its own country, albeit in a in a, in a terrible way. Um, so we can't. We can't absolve ourselves from the responsibility about the fact that the country is what it is. We have to take ownership of some of the problems in the country. We as Congolese do bear responsibility in, in terms of what's going on. Now, how do we arrive at a situation where we create uh, responsive and accountable leadership? As an educator, I think that one of the problems is that political literacy in the country is, is, is nil. People don't vote because they understand the issues because they believe in the ideas that are, that are being presented to them. Be people vote based on ethnic politics. So long as we are not helping the, the, the polity uh, of the Congo to begin to, to vote or to begin to engage in political activity based on ideas and not ethnic politics, then the problems won't go away. So as an educator, I believe in in the, in the need for more civic organizing. I, I believe in the need for more political education so that people understand I'm voting for this person not because he or she is from my, my, my province, but because I believe in the ideas he or she has and those ideas are in sync with my own values. And I think until we get to that point, uh, it's going to be difficult to come up with a government that is accountable and responsive. Um, and in terms of organizing the diaspora, I think I think that that this idea came up in October. Uh, it came up again in March, and I couldn't agree with you more. We do need to do that. Mama and yes and I were talking about that a little a little while ago. Uh, we have to find a way to to make that become something that 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 is a reality. And there are you know a lot of Congolese leaders here, both. Um, um, <coughs> in the region and from, from other parts of the country and, uh, and outside of the country, we can find a way to come together as a people and, and organize that way. Thank you. Health sector? Well, health sector, uh, I'm going to respond to the question by um, Gilbert, Médecin Sans Frontières. I'm going to surprise you. We don't need more doctors in Congo. Actually, we have a surplus of doctors. Now, you have to understand what I'm, what I'm saying by that. With 0 0.4 doctors per 10,000, what do you mean by that? Actually, we don't have enough means to use the physicians that we have. Mm -hmm. So we started exporting our physicians to neighboring countries. So by, by bringing more doctors in, uh, in Congo, more Congolese doctors, we are not solving the problems. The first thing we have to do is to use those who are there. I have a cousin now who is a 
An employee. An employee. And he graduated. He graduated. He's a doctor, a medical doctor. So I'm trying to ask me, can you help me find a job? He has been unemployed. Unemployed for three years. No. I'm going to help him. So it's not by bringing more doctors, by using those who are there. So we have to devise ways to make sure that those who are there can be really used. Now, uh, regarding to the responsible government, I think I, I, my, one of my staff was talking about the essential triad. We, what we, the, our success stories in the past were possible because we have advocates, champions, leaders, good leaders. They were not always Congolese. Some of them were Belgians. For instance, King Albert was the did a lot, has done a lot for Congo than uh, the Congolese. He's the one who created for Ayami, for Milak, all those these things. And resources. So we need those three. Now, how can we get uh, the, the financial resources? I think this is what uh, George was trying to propose. How can we get good champions? Oh, this is where maybe the, the diaspora can play a role. People who are dedicated, who can go beyond the duty. The duty. This is what is missing now in Congo. Champions. Like when King Albert started uh, working for Congo, we had champion like Dr. Truly. Now, leaders, uh, again, I'm going to surprise you. Uh, unfortunately, I agree, I totally agree with what my sister said. We do not have the capacity to select our leaders. We don't have, because of this uh, tri tribal allegiance, because, uh, not only tribal, but people vote because you give me a T-shirt. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, a dollar. People are so poor that really the, the capacity to even think True. beyond a week no. is limited. You give me a T-shirt, I'm going to vote for you. And in that situation, really, those multinationals, those external power they have all the means to impose, to select. And this is what I keep writing in my emails, that even next year, if we have election, this election is going to be free, fair, and transparent. But Congolese are going to select the leaders who have been selected by, okay. by okay. external power. Mm -hmm. There is no way you can go around that. It will take some time when you, you train our young people to become good voters. Now, meanwhile, what can we achieve? This is why we, can, we, are, we are really coming here to ask you, USA, what can you do to make this multinational, this external power, understand that a prosperous Congo is in their interest? So this is why I, I showed you the, the, I mean, the King Leopold, who was a parasite. So I, uh, he, he was there to, you know, to eat Congo, get anything he can in very short time. Albert and Leopold uh, and Baudouin, they changed. They said, oh, Belgium can benefit from a prosperous Congo. So this is the message maybe we should translate to this multinational power. They can benefit more from a benefit from a prosperous Congo. But unfortunately, we Congolese, we don't have now the means to select the leaders, the leaders that really can help. So we are going to get the leaders that impose. you people impose. are going to impose on us. Please, 
select good leaders. <laughs> let's think now, let's move into the win-win. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much for your comments. And um, I think we're going to return to issues surrounding both the political and democratic processes this afternoon. Um, because I believe that we need to think through a lot more dispassionately and a lot more creatively about how the democratic process unfolds currently and how it should unfold that would ensure that um, a lot of what we're talking about, the responsive and accountable leadership does um, come into um, being. Um, a number of people have either asked directly or alluded to the uh, question about what could the U.S. Institute, Institute of Peace do to support these processes. And I think that one of the things that we do best is A, create a forum, and B, provide opportunities for you and your voices to help influence policy, not just here, but also outside the, outside the, the United States. And one example of that is that we have, as our lunchtime speaker, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, who has responsibility for the DRC. She's going to be here. She's going to listen to your questions, and she's going to respond to your questions to provide you with a better idea about where U.S. policy is going vis-a-vis -vis the DRC, and how your excellent ideas could be integrated into strategies for lasting and effective um, change in your country. And so for me, that's one of the pri primary things we could do. We provide a big tent, we make the connections, and we help you um, think through uh, the s um, smart solutions. So he here's what I'm going to propose. Um, we have um, a light lunch uh, um, prepared. Um, I would ask that you go outside, get something to eat, something to drink. We come back in here, and at 12.30, we're going to start um, the lunchtime um, uh, speaker session, and the uh, Ms. Page would make a brief presentation and then engage you for an hour, and then at uh, 1.30, we would have the second panel that would focus on political and security issues. And so, before we close, join me once again in uh, thanking our excellent panel. And, and also thanking our, our, um, web, our live webcast um, viewers who have been sending very, 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 very good questions. I hope that you found your questions answered and that you, continue, and that you join us for the lunchtime discussion. Unfortunately, we can't send you guys lunch. <laughs> but um, you'll join us for the lunchtime session and also for the uh, afternoon panel. Thank you very much. We'll reconvene at 12.30. Thank you.